What's your response going to be the first time you hear that a human has been cloned? How are you going to react the first time you hear that a baby has been born, it's been genetically modified? What are you going to do when you go to the doctor with something, your doctor says, oh, we can fix that using genetic engineering? Now, I ask those questions because those are questions that are not for tomorrow. They're not 10 years from now. Those are questions that we're going to be facing in the immediate near future because they're already possible to do. I'm Dr. C. This is Biblical Genetics. I'm coming to you from the shore of the Arkansas River. I'm actually in Hutchinson, Kansas. I'm not far from the uh, geographic center of the continental United States. So this is literally the heart of America. And the issues for today is something that's going to strike at the heart of America in the very near future. That is genetic engineering. And how do we respond to it? The journal Science reviewed a book called Altered Inheritance by Francoise Bayless. Now, she's a very informed scientist. She's been at the heart of a lot of uh, these genetic issues, and she's written this book about genetic engineering and what it means. Now, it's not really something that I normally would read because I'm a science geek. I, mean, I do genes and DNA and how things work and, and, and mechanisms, but this book has a lot of policy in it and a lot of um, discussion on governments and what they do and polling of people's opinions. And that's very good to know, but it's just not something I'm used to reading. And I've learned a lot. Okay, but that's not the reason why I'm having this episode now. That's not why we're discussing this. It's something else that happened. That book was just background material. By the way, there'll be a link in the show notes for you if you're interested. What happened to precipitate this is a new series that Netflix has just came out with. It's called Unnatural Selection. These are things that I've been talking about with other people and all of a sudden, bam, the cat is out of the bag. So now I want to discuss this with you, my audience, uh, so we can have a, a better understanding, a more robust understanding of some of the issues that have come up. Now, just um, full disclosure here, I don't necessarily recommend you watch this show. I know a lot of people are very sensitive to language and there's a lot of four-letter languages in here. In fact, a lot of inappropriate four-letter language and at least one point where someone breaks one of the Ten Commandments. I want to know. I want to be an informed Christian. I don't want to just be a naysayer or someone who says, oh, that's stupid. And I certainly don't want to be someone um, who falls into conspiracy theory. And I want to know what's happening so that I can have conversations with people and so that I can be influential in policy-making decisions in our society. Okay. Interestingly, this Netflix series, Unnatural Selection, starts off with something that I know a lot about. Not dog breeding, that's the opening scene, a dog breeder, but he's using green fluorescent protein to work through his procedure. He figures that if he can get the dog gene, uh, the dog cells to have green fluorescent protein, then he know he can take some other protein gene and put it into the dog cells. The thing is, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He says these proteins are bioluminescent, but they're not. They're fluorescent. There's a huge difference. Bioluminescence is a chemical reaction that produces light. Fluorescence is a, is a molecule. In fact, you have a lot of fluorescent fibers and dyes in your clothing because we like the way they look. It's a molecule that absorbs light and re-releases it at a different color. Two very different things, but here we have this person doing genetic engineering and he's a newbie. And that's a very interesting thing because genetics is open source. DNA is democratized. Nobody in the world has a complete control over genetics and that's both good and bad. And that's what the series is getting into. The idea that anybody in their garage can monkey around with DNA. Now granted, we're gonna see some really interesting advances and some scientific things that are gonna be like, wow, you can do that, that's really cool, way to go, man, good job. And yet I worry about, you know, imagine if the Columbine shooters didn't shoot up their high school, but they waited another 10 years until they got out of graduate school and they had a genetics background. That's what I worry about. So we need to know what's going on here. We need to know what the capabilities are and we need to understand the ramifications of some of these technologies. Now, I know some people say, oh, that's just playing God. You're not allowed to change DNA. I completely disagree. Completely disagree. I do believe that DNA is under our purview. There's a, a, a thing in the Bible we call the dominion mandate. This is what God told Adam and Eve. 
He basically put Adam and Eve on this earth as stewards of creation. He told them to take care of creation. But to take care of something, you need to know what's going on. You need to know how that thing works. But the pursuit of understanding is called science. And as long as we're not, you know, murdering people in order to, fur to further science, I think we're perfectly able to go and um, examine other life forms, play with their DNA, monkey around with their DNA, if you let me use the phrase. As someone with a background in genetics, I really want other people to understand this. This is one reason why this show exists, because I want you to know what's going on so that we as a society can be better informed and make better decisions about some of these big issues. I also want people to be encouraged that the Bible is true, and that's the history stuff, which I intended on doing this episode, but I uh, skipped it to do this genetic engineering show instead. But science kind of morphs over time. You know, I, I've um, often thought what the future is going to hold in the world of genetics, and some of the things I've been right about and some of the things I've not been right about. And so the way it's, it's changed and turned into what it is today is both exciting and shocking and surprising and amazing all at the same time. Because we're now able to do things that as a society, worldwide, we're not mature enough to answer the questions. Like, what about human cloning? What's the answer to that? I mean, we have all the technology we need to be able to clone human beings. We can clone rats and mice and horses and dogs anytime we want. Dolly the sheep was so long ago, that was a stone age of cloning technology. We can do it safely, cheaply, economically, and quickly today. You see, in the year 2012, the world changed. That was the year that a very smart scientist realized that something was staring us all in the face for over almost 20 years. And she figured out bacteria are able to take DNA and actually cut their genome and stick that piece of DNA into their genome. And it happens at a very specific location. Oh, well, what she realized was that you could take any DNA that you wanted and stick it into any location in the genome that you like. And boom, Jennifer Doudna, future Nobel laureate, I have no doubt, discovered what we call CRISPR. CRISPR gives us the ability to basically edit any DNA any way we like. So if you have a mutation that causes something, you know what, we can change that letter. Or if you don't like your eye color, if you want your child to have a different eye color than your genetics would dictate, well, we can fix that too. CRISPR is crazy and it's already here. In fact, 2012, this is discovered. 2015, only three years later, the first two CRISPR edited human babies were born. And this shocked the world. It was never supposed to happen because all the geneticists and all the ethicists had already said no modification of the germ line. That is, don't do something that would cause someone to have an inheritable trait that could be passed on. That's very different than modifying an adult to fix a problem because you don't necessarily know what all the downstream ramifications are. And so these two children were born with a mutation that confers upon them the ability to resist HIV. It's not guaranteed that they'll never get HIV if, if they're exposed to it, but it does give them a resistance to HIV. Without really consulting the rest of the scientific community, this Chinese scientist forged ahead and out popped these two baby girls. Now, in the book, uh, Altered Inheritance, uh, Francois Bayless says that the idea that an embryo can give informed consent, which is one of my criticisms, is a red herring. And I completely don't agree. It's not a red herring. Yeah, it's true that embryos can't consent to anything. They, they don't decide when they're born, who their parents are, what their dad might have been smoking the day before they were conceived, right? So they, they don't have anything to do with the environment, the genetics that led to their conception and their birth. Okay. But if you take an embryo and give it a genetic modification that will have negative genetic implications in the future, that's not right. You are potentially harming a future human being. And so it should never have been done. Now, I don't think this is a red herring at all. I think it's a very critical and very important issue. I don't think we should just skip over it like that. And in this book, Francoise, she talks about a lot of public opinion polls. And it's really interesting because just about everybody, I say the large majority of people do not believe you should be experimenting on human embryos. Another large group of people do not believe that you should be doing things that can be inherited in the future. 
but most people do believe that it should be permissible to do a genetic modification on an adult that can fix a genetic problem. A couple of problems with this. First of all, it's usually too late because the genetics has already had all this time to work out before they grow up. Um, but also, ooh, it's a slippery slope. Because sure, you fix one little thing here, but what about the next thing? And what about the next thing? And what about the next thing? Or if you've got a genetic problem, like um, the illustration used in the book is that short people have problems in life. They're, the world isn't designed for short people. It's like the world's not designed for left-handed people either, but it's not designed for short people. It's designed for average-sized people. And short people, very short people, I mean, they, they struggle a bit. Well, what if two parents said, you know what, I don't want my child to struggle. I want them to be average size. So let's do a genetic modification and give them a gene that they normally wouldn't get from us, but it's a gene that's out there in the world. Other people have this gene. Well, let's give it to them. And all of a sudden they can be taller. Sounds great, right? Except you've also changed your athletic ability. You made them stronger. You've made them faster. Okay. But when you look at super athletes, very often they carry a genetic factor that makes them a super athlete. It makes them different than the average person. So that already exists in the world. What would be wrong with taking a normal sized person and giving them a tall gene and make them an NBA basketball player or a strong gene and making them an NFL linebacker or something like that? I mean, what would be wrong with that? Those things already exist. You're not changing and making them a super person. You're making them a person that already exists. Ah, ooh, and everything opens up in this Pandora's box sort of way. But there are a lot of other moral issues at stake here. Uh, it's hard to say. I, I, I'm, I'm going to say this straight up. I am 100% pro-life. I'm a very strong pro-life advocate. And in fact, scientifically, life begins at conception. There's no way around that. As soon as conception happens, the only thing that's going to stop that fertilized egg, that little incipient human being, from becoming a voting member in society is trauma. There could be a birth anomaly that has downstream ramifications and a spontaneous abortion, or there could be a failure to, to have implantation in the womb or abortion, or all sorts of ways to, to kill infants, you know, diseases and things like that before they reach adulthood. But the only thing that's going to stop the process of becoming a fully fledged adult person is trauma. Therefore, scientifically, life begins at conception. I think that's very clear, but just about all the embryologists have decided that they're going to use a 14-day window. What that does is it reduces the moral hazard of the situation. Uh, it takes about 14 days before an embryo cannot be split and make a twin. You, you do understand that, that identical twins are clones. You know that, right? So we know that cloning happens naturally. You, you got that? You think about it that way. Oh yeah, cloning is not that big a deal in some way. But you take this 14 day embryo and once it's beyond that, it can't split to make, uh, make clones anymore. And it starts to develop a neural crest, which is, is the, uh, future, um, the future nervous system. And at that point, you know, there's pain receptors and things like that. So, Below that though, well, you know, the thing can't scream in pain if you flush it down the drain or if you stick it with a needle. And it's kind of like everyone's consciences are, are more relaxed. Now, I don't like this, but it is the status quo across just about all the genetics laboratories in the world. But when we're talking about genetic modification of people, we're talking about also the creation of a whole bunch of embryos that are gonna die. This is a pro-life issue, Christians. This is a very much of a pro-life issue, and you need to understand how strong a pro-life issue this is. Actually, it, it, it makes me emotional to talk about this, and I can't get emotional because I have to be sober and calm because when we address these things in a public forum, we can't get angry, we can't shout, we can't yell, we can't call people names. We have to be sober and deliberate and very well educated. You can't just say, you're not allowed to play God. That doesn't work. You have to say why and give them a reason. Why you believe what you believe and why you don't want these things to happen, then you have to vote. And you have to vote consistently. Okay, but it's not about politics. It's about the 14 day window and selective abortion. You see, in order to develop a new genetic thing, 
uh, they get to do lots of experimenting on embryos. And then they'll watch those embryos grow, and the ones they don't like, they discard. Ooh. And the ones they do like, they might implant in the womb. But what happens if that embryo doesn't develop like they want? Or what happens if they put more embryos there than the mother wants to give birth to? They say, okay, well, you know what, we'll take this one and not these. And so the moral hazard here is for us. Five, ten years from now, when you go to the doctor and you say, doctor, I've got X, Y, or Z, he says, oh, well, we can fix that with this genetic technology. How many of us are going to remember to ask the doctor, how many babies died in order to produce this technology? A lot of people might say, you know what, I don't want a child with Huntington's. Let's make a bunch of embryos, let them grow, genetically test them, and not implant the ones who carry it and only implant the ones who don't. Look at that. You just fixed something. You just stopped Huntington's disease in his, in his tracks, in your family, in that generation. But oh, what a messy web of morality this is. It's really ugly and really difficult. You know, it, it impacts me too. Now, I don't have a genetic disease but I have a, what's called a CDC positive test for Lyme disease. I grew up in, in uh, Long Island, New York, the epicenter of the Lyme epidemic. Right when it was happening, I was a Boy Scout. I, I, I spent my summers at summer camp. I mean, I was outside all the time. And sure enough, as an adult, I thought I had multiple sclerosis. And I went to the doctor, I said, doc, this is, here's my list of symptoms. And he said, they asked close, but no, you, um, you're missing a couple things if you really had MS. And there's a couple things in there that shouldn't be. We're going to test you for Lyme disease, and I lit the test up. But what if there's a CRISPR technology that comes in the future that says, oh, we can fix those neurological problems that you have from your, your lingering Lyme disease. Or maybe we can kill off the bacteria finally and fully in your body so you never have to struggle with this again. Would I do it? After everything I just told you, would I do it? And that is a question that we're all going to have to face. It's hard. It's not easy, and you know what? It sure is scary. But there's an introduction to modern genetic engineering and how it impacts us in the heartland. If you're still listening to this, God bless you to make wise life choices and decisions in education and in medicine. Get involved, get yourself educated. You can find links to the things I talked about in the show notes. There's a lot of other things out there also for you to go explore yourself. I just love doing this. I love talking to people, love encouraging people. And I love being a Christian in the world of science. Get involved. If you like this, please give us a thumbs up. Uh, please subscribe to our podcast or to our, our YouTube channel. You can find us on Facebook on Biblical Genetics. Um, you, can, you can become part of a community that's trying to push some issues and be Christ-like in a world that seems to have forgotten Christ.